Crawford, and we're going to be covering um, some basic introduction to accounting concepts and terms this morning. Welcome. Um, to begin with, when we talk about accounting, we recognize the importance of the story that essentially is going to be told through reports that we call financial statements. Remember, there are four. We have the income statement, which is going to tell us how's the company doing? Are they to match all the expenses incurred during the same period and whether or not they would result in a profit or net income? We then progress to what is called the statement of owner's equity statement of retained earnings. Essentially, what have we done with the profit? Are we keeping it in the company, or are we distributing it to the owners? We then go to the balance sheet. And the balance sheet tells the part of the story about what's the value of assets, properties of value that will benefit a company in the future, how much debt do we have? What do we owe our creditors? And finally, the net worth. What belongs to the owners of the business? We also have something called a statement of cash flows. And that statement of cash flows essentially answers the question of where has cash come from and what do we use the cash for? Sometimes we call the statement of cash flows the statement of sources and uses. So that's what the purpose is. Now, how do we get to the numbers that will ultimately appear in the financial statements? So the first part of our journey begins with determining how a company is going to raise money. And we call those financing activities. Where will the capital a company needs come from? What will be the source? And essentially, there are two. You can either get owners to contribute. We call that the owner contribution. And we're going to give that a nice big happy face. And that's because whenever an owner essentially contributes something to a business, whether that business is in the form of a small proprietorship, partnership, or larger corporation, that ownership contribution always increases the value. And that's because essentially what happens is the owners are giving money to the business. And in exchange, the business essentially is merely providing an opportunity for benefit. The company has to become successful so that the investment made by the owner will ultimately be realized. But as far as reporting the transaction on our financial statements, we call that a win-win why the business has received the value of the monies transferred in from the owners. And in exchange, really all we've done is provided an opportunity in the future. So the business doesn't really give anything tangible away. Second option for financing is if we borrow money. And I always give this an unhappy face. All right, now, does that mean every single time we have borrowings, it is a bad business decision? No, of course not. But the reason why I give it an unhappy face is because the borrowing of money does place an obligation for repayment on the company. So yes, they've received the value, the monies that were borrowed, but they also have a corresponding liability or debt on the books of the company. Okay, 
So when you borrow money, what that does is it creates a liability. And as we're going to see through our journey, liabilities are obligations to repay debt in the future. When we call owner contribution, that is referred to as equity financing. When we borrow money, we refer to that as debt financing. So if you're going to be involved in the financial community, that's a lot of what you do. You structure deals. You advise clients as to what is the best way to raise capital. So once we have decided how, and usually for most companies it's a blend. You don't just borrow money or you don't just take contributions or issue shares of stock. You usually do a little bit of both. The owner contribution, especially if you're talking about a stock, we call that an IPO, an initial public offering. That's when a company first issues shares of stock to the public. The debt financing is something that will return to companies can do a lot more frequently. You're not always taking contributions from owners or selling shares of stock. We tend to do more of the debt financing on a continual basis. After you've raised your capital, after you have some money, then a business has to decide what to do with it. And generally, those are referred to as our investment activities. And when we have investment activities, what a company needs to do is they need to acquire what are called assets. And assets are going to provide a company with future value. We always give our assets a happy face. The hope is the assets that we acquire will provide us the opportunity very easily to repay those creditors. All right, so we're hoping that when we make the investment in the assets, the assets we invest in will ultimately help us become more valuable. The third, and most probably the most important decision made by our management team, is the operating activities. And that's essentially why we do what we do. IBM, Facebook, Twitter, they're not in the business of borrowing money selling stock, acquiring assets. They're in the business of providing internet services or computers, or if you're Starbucks, you're selling coffee. So what we call operating activities is essentially the day-to-day -day business. That's your purpose. All of our liabilities are going to be similar. All liabilities represent debt, money that has to be repaid in the future. All assets will be similar. All assets will provide future value. When we get over to this segment of the decision making, and this really is what is referred to as the net worth piece, it's more of a blended family. And what I mean by that is some of these transactions and accounts will benefit and add value to our company, and others will diminish the value of our company. So why do we go into business? Well, the first reason we go into business is because we want to earn revenue. And we're going to give that also a happy face. Earning revenue, and you can do it in two ways. You can either sell a product, all right, so you're selling computers, you are having what is called sales revenue. You can also earn revenue by providing a service. So you go to a lawyer for some legal advice, you go to a doctor for medical advice, you hire an advertising agency. That's what we refer to as service revenue. <coughs> 
And our economy, the US-based economy, tends to be a little bit more in the service-oriented arena right now than we are more so in what we used to be, which was manufacturing. Now, the key to revenue is you have to have earned it. And our guiding principles that we must adhere to as we tell the story of accounting are called generally accepted accounting principles known by the acronym GAAP. And one of the primary pieces of the rules that we look at very closely is this principle, which means we only want revenue that we have earned. It can't be an idea. It can't be a plan. It can't be a hope from the service provider or the seller of the product, their part in the process must be completed. Now, we follow what is called accrual-based accounting. Generally accepted accounting principles recommends what is called accrual-based accounting. And with accrual-based accounting, as long as the revenue's been earned, we don't care whether it's been paid in cash or not. So many times, the earning of revenue will also trigger something called an account receivable. So whenever you earn revenue, what we say on account, what that means is the seller or service provider has completed their job, but the customer hasn't yet paid us. There's a promise to pay us in the future. And that promise to pay us in the future is called an account receivable. So once we earn revenue, unfortunately, associated with that earning of revenue will be the fact that we will incur expenses. And we're going to give expenses a sad face. And we give expenses an unhappy face because expenses, by definition, are assets that have no future value. Salary expense, rent expense, utility expense. It doesn't really matter what the first name is. As long as the last name is expense, we always place it in connection with the revenue that was earned during that time period. And therefore, there's another generally accepted accounting principle we follow, and that's called the matching principle. We want to make sure that all expenses incurred are going to be matched up in the same time period as the revenue that was generated. So for example, when we determine whether or not a company has earned a profit, or what we call net income, or a loss during a time period, that time period is definite. It's either a period that's covering a month, or a quarter, or a year. And we report that information pertaining to revenue and expense on the piece of the story called the income statement. So we're going to earn revenue, yay. Unfortunately, we're going to have expenses associated with that. And the difference between revenue and expense will either create for us a profit, which obviously would be good, or a loss, which obviously would not be good. All right, so revenue less expenses will generate for a company what is called the net income, the profit, or in some instances, if the revenue is less than the expenses, you will have a loss. Those are your day-to-day -day operational activities. And the plan is that we're going to utilize assets very 
popular asset that we utilize, especially if we're selling a product, is inventory. The goal is to sell the inventory in order to generate your revenue. So these are the purpose in your investments. You want to make sure that you're investing in the right amount of assets that will essentially enable you to generate a sufficient amount of revenue. If you're a manufacturer, if you're making the product that you sell, you're also going to want to make sure you have a sufficient amount of equipment, machinery, and then your raw materials will consist, uh, your inventory will then consist of what we call raw materials. Well, what happens if we have a profit? Again, another decision must be made. And uh, we have two options. We can keep it or we can pay it to the owners. If we keep it, the value of the company will increase. All right, so we call that in a corporation retained earnings. I liken the retained earnings kind of to the piggy bank of the corporation. You're putting the value aside for a future time period. For sole proprietors or partnerships, when the value is retained in the company, what will happen is the owner's capital account will go up. So we always look very closely at what is the format of the business. What is it that we initially decided when we formed our business? And that will also determine a little bit of some of the account names we use. Whether you're a small business or a large corporation, the owner contribution is the piece that's a little bit different. Liabilities are the same. Assets are the same. Revenue is the same. Expense is the same. The only piece that's a drop different is the way in which we look at net worth. If you pay it to the owners, and many times that's the reason why people invest in your company, for example, in large corporations, one of the reasons why the business is uh, able to sell stock is because the investors, called stockholders, would like to share in the profits. That's one of the benefits of ownership of the business. If it's profitable, I get some of it. And so with a corporation, when you share in the profits, we call that a dividend. All right, so if we're paying out a portion of the profit to the owners of a corporation, it's called a dividend. If, on the other hand, you have a small business entity similar to a dividend, we call it a drawing. Dividends are going to reduce value as drawings will reduce value. Retained earnings will increase value as it will if it's an owner capital account. And so clearly, if you were to open the books of IBM or Starbucks or Google, you're not going to see happy faces abounding in their reports. But from a teaching vantage point, I think when we're first learning some of these basic concepts and ideas, it's good to be able to visualize what happens. And obviously, the goal always, and we function in a capitalistic economy, is to generate a sufficient amount of profit to make it worthwhile to those who believed in us and, in essence, provided the financing. So the owners who contribute the money hope that we will be profitable and that will enhance their investment. And clearly the creditors' intent when they invest in us is that they expect repayment of the debt. And usually that repayment will come with something called interest. Okay.
So those are the basic concepts. And essentially, it's very critical that in the very beginning of our process, we are able to understand what an owner contribution represents, what a liability is, what an asset is, what we mean by revenue, what we mean by expense, retained earnings and dividend for a corporation, or owner's capital and drawing for a small business. And so essentially, we take these financing activities decisions, and we will ultimately provide information in the form of what I called earlier the financial statements, the income statement, the balance sheet, et cetera. But before we get to the point of preparing financial statements, there are very specific steps that we must go through. And we refer to these steps as the accounting cycle. And really, I liken them to rules. There are very specific rules that we use in accounting to make sure that when the information is ultimately provided in the form of an annual report or the financial statements, the information is useful, it's relevant, it's complete, so that decision makers, creditors, and investors can make the best decisions possible. So remember, I said the accounting guidelines are called generally accepted accounting principles or GAAP. We haven't exactly gotten together with the international community we're not in agreement with all of the guidelines, but many we have. And those accounting guidelines essentially provide us with what is, for lack of a better concept, the do's and the don'ts. And so we're going to look at our accounting cycle. And the accounting cycle is critical to ultimately having the information that is ultimately going to be reported in financial statements accurate. So we start the process with what we call analyzing business transactions. Every single day, corporations and small businesses engage in transactions. They buy supplies. They pay their rent. They borrow money. They make sales to their customers. It's a wide array of different types of transactions. And we want to make sure that these business transactions are reported or captured as accurately as possible because ultimately, they're going to be part of a very important story called the financial statements. So the first rule in reporting these business transactions from a, an accounting viewpoint is there will always be two accounts affected. And if there are more than two, that's called a compound entry. So when we first begin teaching accounting, we try to keep it as basic as possible. I liken everything we do in accounting to a seesaw. We want to make sure that we're keeping our seesaw in balance. If you don't have two people sitting on a seesaw, it's no fun. So there's got to be two accounts. Now, what can those accounts consist of? They can be assets, properties of value. They can be liabilities, debt. Or they can be part of my blended family. They can be revenue transactions, expense transactions, can pertain to either keeping value or making distributions to the owners. So by accounts, we mean that broad spectrum of asset, liability, or net worth. 
Rule number two, there are only seven possible outcomes for any business transaction. So even though we're just taking a beginning accounting class, even if we were to be sitting at the boardroom at IBM making a very, very complex decision, there's still only seven possible outcomes that could take place. And what are they? Well, one is if you increase one asset, you have to reduce another. One asset up, another asset down. Keep that seesaw in balance. You could perhaps increase an asset <clears throat> and increase a liability. Now, why do I liken it to a seesaw? Because what one of the fundamental aspects of accounting that we follow is something called the accounting equation. Everything we do <clears throat> in accounting is built upon this accounting equation. It's like a seesaw. What is the accounting equation? Its assets must be equal to liabilities plus net worth. Assets, properties of value. And those assets, some of those assets belong to the creditors and the remaining belongs to the owners. Okay? So liabilities is what is owed to the creditors and this is what belongs to the owners. The lenders are creditors. The owners are the ones that, in essence, gave us money. So my seesaw has assets on this side and liabilities and net worth on the other side. And so if one asset goes up, if you don't decrease another asset, you have to either increase a liability or a net worth, which is our next option. If an asset goes up, your net worth would also have to go up. And there are only two times that net worth goes up. Net worth goes up when owners contribute money, yay, and net worth goes up when we earn revenue. All right, we also have a situation where an asset will go down, but another asset doesn't go up, and so that is option where asset goes down, but so does the liability. So we reduce the debt, but in order to reduce that debt or that liability, we had to pay it. And cash is probably one of the most important assets a company has. If an asset goes down and another asset didn't go up, it could also be because our net worth went down. And there are two times when we have an unhappy face with net worth. That's when we incur an expense or we either pay a dividend or provide a drawing. One, two, three, four, five. These are by far the most common. Over here, we'll see if we do nothing to an asset. If a liability goes up, then your net worth would have to go down. So everything is happening on this side of your seesaw. Or if a liability goes down, your net worth would have to go up. We'll talk a little bit more about these two when we do accruals and adjustments. But when we're first learning accounting, we primarily see transactions that in some way, shape, or form involve an asset. Either cash is going up, or cash is going down, or equipment's going up, supplies are going up, liabilities are going up, et cetera. OK. So that's very, very important. Now, we also, the next step, and we're still in step one, and I cannot stress to my students enough that the analysis of the business transactions, 
is by far the most critical piece in the accounting cycle. Because if you don't get that piece right, everything else we do will be wrong. We will just consistently carry that mistake along with us. So we take a lot of care initially to make sure that the business transactions are analyzed correctly. All right, so we have to identify the two accounts. Could be two assets, could be an asset and a liability, could be an asset and net worth, or could be a liability and a net worth. Okay, if an asset goes up, either another asset has to go down or a liability or a net worth has to go up. If an asset goes down, either a liability has to go down or a net worth has to go down. Now, once we're done figuring out the accounts, deciding the outcome, step C is determining whether to debit or credit. Debit and credit are literally Latin terms for left and right. And there's no rhyme or reason why debits do what they do to assets and credits do what they do to assets and liabilities and so forth. We've just determined that when we have a transaction and it is debited, Debits will always increase assets, reduce liabilities, and reduce net worth. And remember, the only time net worth goes down is if we have an expense or a dividend or if we're a small business, a drawing. That's it. So when assets go up, we debit. When liabilities go down, we debit. When our net worth goes down, we debit. On the other hand, when our assets go down, we credit. When our liabilities go up, we credit. And when our net worth goes up we credit. And remember, net worth goes up twice, and that's when the owner makes a contribution or when we earn revenue. Those are the two times. Debiting and crediting is the foundation upon which everything we do in accounting is based. So as we analyze business transactions and go through this multi-step process, we have to make sure that we are understanding the importance of correctly identifying what's happening. For example, when a corporation or a business goes to the bank and borrows money, that's a financing activity. What's happening to the company? Two accounts are being impacted. The corporation is receiving cash from the bank. Yay, our assets are going up. But they now have an obligation or a liability to the bank to repay the monies borrowed. That is a liability. That also went up. And so that would be outcome here. Asset cash up, liability bank loan up. Now, once we've identified the two accounts and the outcome, then we have to decide, well, how are we going to tell the story? And we tell the story through debiting and crediting. So in that transaction, when our asset cash went up, we would debit cash, and our liability also went up, we would credit the liability. So another rule is, 
with the debit and credit is every transaction will have one account debited and another account credited. All right, so every transaction has one debit and one credit. Can it have more than a debit and a credit? Yes. If you have compound transactions where you're impacting more than two accounts, then you could have more debits than credits. You could debit two accounts and only credit one account. However, in every business transaction, your total debits must always equal your total credits. Remember my seesaw. If you have more value on the debit side than you have on the credit side or vice versa, your seesaw is out of sync. So throughout the process of accounting, we are always focusing on this accounting equality. And therefore, the only way to maintain the accounting equation is by being consistent with the analysis of the transactions, where we're saying, OK, it's got to be two accounts. There's only seven possible outcomes. There always has to be one account that we're debiting and another that we're crediting. Can be more, but there has to be at least one of each. And at the end, the total of debits and credits must equal. So step one is critical. If you make the mistake in step one, you've got a problem. Now, once you've made all these decisions, we can go to our second step, which is record in the journal. So once we've identified what accounts, what the outcome is, whether we're going to debit or credit, we can then pick up the pen and put pen to paper. When you record in a journal, we refer to the journal as the book of original entry. A journal is merely a piece of paper with columns. That's pretty much what a journal looks like. You have a date column. You have an item or account name column. You have a debit column. And you have a credit column. And when you record in a journal, the account that is being debited always gets recorded first. So let's return to my original example. Company goes to the bank, borrows $10,000 in cash. We've determined the two accounts that are being impacted are cash and bank loan. Cash is an asset. <clears throat> it went up. Bank loan is a liability. It also went up. And based on my analysis here, we're going to debit the cash. We're going to credit the liability. So today, we would write the date, whatever that is. The account being debited is always recorded first. And we put that under the debit column. I always add a little arrow. And again, if you look at corporate America, you're not going to see in journals pluses and arrows and happy faces. But it's just a visual so that you're seeing what's happening to my cash. My cash is going up because I received that money from the bank. The account being credited is always indebted, indented a little bit to the right. And usually, liabilities have the last name payable. So we're going to record under the credit column Bank loan payable is the account name, $10,000 credit. And so you will go through every single business transaction in a similar way. You record the account being debited first. You put the amount under the debit column. You indent a little bit to the right. 
the account that is next being credited, and you put that amount under the credit column. Remember, in every business transaction, your total debits and your total credits must equal. If they don't, your accounting equation will not be in balance. All right. Once we're done with the journal, the next step is to post or transfer that information to the ledgers. Every single account, every asset account, every liability account, and my blended family, our net worth, revenue, all the expenses, the owner contribution for a corporation, that's common stock. For a small business, that's the owner's capital account. The dividend for the corporation or the drawing for the small business. They all have their own ledger accounts. And what we do essentially is we transfer from the journal to the ledger. And ledgers really just look like big capital T's. And as I said earlier, debit means left and credit means right. And so that's where we put the debit and credit in the ledger. We put the debit on the left and we put the credit on the right. And same idea. I use my arrows. And what we'll do, essentially, is we will transfer, that's what post means, the same information. So if this is transaction A, I'm going to debit my cash $10,000, and I'm going to credit my bank loan payable $10,000. So every single transaction that you have analyzed and you have determined the names of the accounts, what the outcome is, and whether you're debiting and crediting, once you record that information in the journal, the journal is showing us the big picture, what the total impact it had on the business. The ledgers show us what the individual impact it had on each individual account. And so that's where I would get my individual account balances in the ledger. The fourth step is to prepare a trial balance. And the trial balance is merely a listing of all of the assets that are in your ledger, the liabilities that are in your ledger, revenue accounts, expense accounts, dividend or drawing accounts, it's common stock or owner capital accounts. You list them all in a trial balance. You keep the families together. All the assets are listed together. All the liabilities are listed together. And all of the owner's equity or net worth or stockholder's equity, same idea, are listed together. We expect assets to have a debit balance. When you look in your ledger, assets will normally have what we call a debit balance. Liabilities will normally have what is called a credit balance. My blended family, the owner contribution <clears throat> and the revenue will have credit balances. The expense and dividends or drawing will have debit balances. Okay? We call that the normal balance. In your trial balance, all assets are listed together. They should all have debit balances. All liabilities are listed together. They should all have credit balances. Then we get to our equity. The owner contribution, common stock, or capital account will have a credit balance. Revenue will have a credit balance. 
expense will have a debit balance offered and we're going to be covering um, some basic introduction to accounting concepts and terms this morning. Welcome. Um, to begin with, when we talk about accounting, we recognize the importance of the story that essentially is going to be told through reports that we call financial statements. Remember, there are four. We have the income statement, which is going to tell us how's the company doing? Are they to match all the expenses incurred during the same period and whether or not they would result in a profit or net income? We then progress to what is called the statement of owner's equity, statement of retained earnings. Essentially, what have we done with the profit? Are we keeping it in the company or are we distributing it to the owners? We then go to the balance sheet. And the balance sheet tells the part of the story about what's the value of assets, properties of value that will benefit a company in the future, how much debt do we have, what do we owe our creditors, and finally the net worth, what belongs to the owners of the business. We also have something tend to do more of the debt financing on a continual basis. After you've raised your capital, after you have some money, then a business has to decide what to do with it. And generally, those are referred to as our investment activities. And when we have investment activities, what a company needs to do is they need to acquire what are called assets. And assets are going to provide a company with future value. We always give our assets a happy face. The hope is the assets that we acquire will provide us the opportunity very easily to repay those creditors. All right, so we're hoping that when we make the investment in the assets, the assets we invest in will ultimately help us become more valuable. The third, and most probably the most important decision made by our management team, is the operating activities. And that's essentially why we do what we do. IBM, Facebook, Twitter, they're not in the business of borrowing money, selling stock. What happens is the owners are giving money to the business. And in exchange, the business essentially is merely providing an opportunity for benefit. The company has to become successful so that the investment made by the owner will ultimately be realized. But as far as reporting the transaction on our financial statements, we call that a win-win why the business has received the value of the monies transferred in from the owners. And in exchange, really all we've done is provided an opportunity in the future. So the business doesn't really give anything tangible away. Second option for financing is if we borrow money. And I always give this an unhappy face. All right, now, does that mean every single time we have borrowings, it is a bad business decision? No, of course not. But the reason why I give it an unhappy face is because the borrowing of money does place an obligation for repayment on the company. So yes, they've received the value, the monies that were borrowed, but they also have a corresponding called a statement of cash flows. 
And that statement of cash flows essentially answers the question of where has cash come from and what do we use the cash for? Sometimes we call the statement of cash flows the statement of sources and uses. So that's what the purpose is. Now, how do we get to the numbers that will ultimately appear in the financial statements? So the first part of our journey begins with determining how a company is going to raise money. And we call those financing activities. Where will the capital a company needs come from? What will be the source? And essentially, there are two. You can either get owners to contribute. We call that the owner contribution. And we're going to give that a nice big happy face. And that's because whenever an owner essentially contributes something to a business, whether that business is in the form of a small proprietorship, partnership, or larger corporation, that ownership contribution always increases the value. And that's because essentially what liability or debt on the books of the company, OK? So when you borrow money, what that does is it creates a liability. And as we're going to see through our journey, liabilities are obligations to repay debt in the future. When we call owner contribution, that is referred to as equity financing. When we borrow money, we refer to that as debt financing. So if you're going to be involved in the financial community, that's a lot of what you do. You structure deals. You advise clients as to what is the best way to raise capital. So once we have decided how, and usually for most companies, it's a blend. You don't just borrow money, or you don't just take contributions or issue shares of stock. You usually do a little bit of both. The owner contribution, especially if you're talking about a stock, we call that an IPO, an initial public offering. That's when a company first issues shares of stock to the public. The debt financing is something that will return to companies can do a lot more frequently. You're not always taking contributions from owners or selling shares of stock. We